Hi, I'm Elizabeth Johnson, and this is Western Civ Foundations. Today is week 11, lesson three, and we're talking about the life and death of Socrates. To start off today's lecture, I'm going to share some quotes from Socrates that give us a peek into his mind. I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. The only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. By all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you'll become happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. And by all accounts, this last statement was made on behalf of his own unhappy marital situation. So who was Socrates? Now the boring answer is that he was an ancient Greek philosopher that lived from 470 to 399 BC. Well, what's a philosopher? A philosopher is someone who studies or practices philosophy. What is philosophy? Well, now you've opened a can of worms. The online dictionary Wordnik defines philosophy as the study of the nature, causes, or principles of reality, knowledge, or values based on logical reasoning. But my advice to you is don't get a philosopher started on the definition of philosophy. We'll talk more about this in the next Western Civ class when we talk about Socrates and ancient Greek philosophy. Before today, you've probably heard the name Socrates, and you may have some fuzzy understanding that he is somehow related to the study of philosophy. If you've ever seen the movie The Princess Bride, then you've heard the character Vicini say, have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, morons, as he tries to support his claims of superiority over Wesley? At 70 years of age, Socrates was arrested on charges of impiety and corrupting the youth. Brought before a jury of his fellow Athenian citizens, he gave a lengthy defense of his ideas and philosophical methods. He knew that a majority vote in favor of his guilt would lead to the death penalty. Socrates' student Plato wrote a document called the Apology, which gives a report of the words that Socrates gave at this defense. Of course, we have no way of knowing how accurate this account is or if Plato was even there. Was it based on notes that he took during the trial or written down afterward, relying on memory? We don't know. In any case, it is considered a foundational document in the history of Western civilization. And we're going to read a few things Socrates said in his defense in the Apology and learn a little bit about his life. Thankfully, this is a very understandable document to read. And this was one that helped me realize I can tackle reading real documents from ancient history. Now next year we're going to do a close reading of this and other books that will help us learn more about Socrates and his philosophy. The Apology begins with Socrates saying, How you Athenians have been affected by my accusers, I cannot tell. But I know that they almost made me forget who I was, so persuasively did they speak, and yet they have hardly uttered a word of truth. But of the many falsehoods told by them, there was one which quite amazed me. I mean, when they said that you should be upon your guard and not allow yourselves to be deceived by the force of my eloquence, they have scarcely spoken the truth at all. But from me, you shall hear the whole truth. Yes. The words of many an individual on trial. I speak the words of truth and my accusers lie. Well, what exactly was Socrates accused of and who was this rabble rouser? In his defense, Socrates apparently quotes from the affidavit against him saying, Socrates is an evildoer and a curious person who searches into things under the earth and in heaven and he makes the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrine to others. Further in the defense, we read that he was also accused of corrupting the youth of Athens. 
Now, not too much is known about Socrates the man. From written accounts, we know he was rather homely in his looks. He had three sons, and his wife, Xanthippe, thought he was a no-good loser of a dad who didn't support his family. We know he fought in the Peloponnesian War, and he was the teacher of some of the oligarchs who briefly came to power a few years before his trial. Now, many political prisoners were brought to trial in the same year as Socrates, in 399 BC. He may very well have been brought before the Athenian council because he was suspected of causing trouble at a very difficult time in the history of his homeland. He was a person who asked questions about everything. And if there's anything we learn in history, it's that people who ask questions and spread ideas of having questions about the culture, the religion, the government, those people are highly suspect. Now, Socrates was notorious for spending time in the Agora, which was simply a gathering place in Athens, where people would gather to talk about athletics, business, politics, things like religion and art. But his approach to discussion was through asking questions. And some of these questions left people feeling that their ancient institutions and religious beliefs might be less understood than previously thought. Although the accusations brought against him might sound frivolous today, many political prisoners through history have faced such accusations and have been feared by those in power. We know about Socrates mostly from the books written by his student, Plato, that were presented as dialogues between various people. So in these dialogues, there's various characters and they just speak. You don't get any commentary. You just get their voices speaking. So the character of Socrates would ask questions or he would require definitions of words from the other characters in the dialogue. At the end of a given question and answer conversation, a complete understanding of the topic at hand is not necessarily presented. The reader of the dialogues is meant to finish the dialogue in his or her mind and to reach a final understanding. And this was a deliberate technique. Now I have a sample conversation between Socrates and a character named Lakeys. I think courage is a sort of mental persistence. That's what I'd say if I had to identify the nature of courage in all situations. Well, that's exactly what we have to do if we were to answer the question we asked ourselves. Now, I'll tell you what I think. I don't think you take every instance of persistence to be courage. My reason for saying this is that I'm almost sure, Lakeys, that you count courage as something rather admirable. Yes. But what about unintelligent persistence? Isn't that, on the contrary, dangerous and harmful? Yes. Well, if anything is harmful and dangerous, is it admirable, would you say? No, that wouldn't be a defensible position, Socrates. So you wouldn't agree that this kind of persistence was courage, since it isn't admirable, but courage is an admirable thing. That's right. Now, this is just a sample, a tiny bit of a longer conversation. And if you're interested, you can read the longer exchange between Lakeys and Socrates on this topic of courage. Just check in your assignments. Um, and now imagine yourself being in the place of Lakeys and how you might answer Socrates' questions. Kind of set your head swimming to be in the place of the person being questioned. When Socrates was wandering through the Agora, he would approach anyone, young or old, wise or perhaps not, and ask questions about a range of topics such as Homer's writings, wisdom, politics, punishment, 
the person's skills or vocation and the human body and human nature. He questioned the mythological beliefs of the Greeks, and apparently he had his own god that he sort of ascribed to that is not well defined in the writings about him. Now, we're going to go back to his trial and find out what happened to him. In the last portion of the Apology, Socrates states, I am convinced that I never intentionally wronged anyone although I cannot convince you. I have not the boldness or impudence or inclination to address you as you would have liked me to do, weeping and wailing and lamenting and saying and doing many things which you have been accustomed to hear from others and which, as I maintain, are unworthy of me. I would rather die having spoken after my manner than speak in your manner and live. He goes on speaking of the nobleness of death and of those who prepare for death with integrity. One of my favorite passages near the end says, if you think that by killing men you can prevent someone from censuring your evil lives, you're mistaken. That is not a way of escape which is either possible or honorable. The easiest and the noblest way is not to be disabling others but to improving yourselves. And then he says, no evil can happen to a good man, either in life or after death. He and his are not neglected by the gods. Despite Socrates' defense and the words that he spoke, he was found guilty of impiety and of corrupting the youth. His sentence was to end his own life by drinking deadly hemlock. Now, your assignments include the following. You are reading from Stories of the Ancient Greeks, the introduction through the Ring of Polycrates. You can, of course, skip the Odyssey chapters unless you'd like to read them. Finish this reading by the end of the week. For fun, if you would like to download and read the longer conversation between Lakeys and Socrates about courage, you can do so. It's right on the website. That's all I've got for today. I'll see you next time.